everybody. So right now we are going to talk about the Cold War and Vietnam. Uh, I already did my lecture on the politics of the 1960s. Um, now we're focusing on uh, the foreign policy or the, the Cold War and particularly the Vietnam War. And when it comes to Vietnam and the Cold War, we're really uh, looking at how these two things, how the Vietnam is kind of a, a a manifestation, if you will, of the Cold War. Uh, so we're going to be looking first at how did Kennedy fight the Cold War. We'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the major, you know, kind of conflicts, um, particularly the Cuban Missile Crisis, and then we'll get into talking about Vietnam itself, why the war in Vietnam was fought, how it was part of the larger Cold War, and then how did the Vietnam War affect American society. Uh, so first off, we have to talk a little bit about who Kennedy was. Uh, as a you know as a leader as a cold warrior um, and he was as much or even perhaps more of a cold warrior than his predecessor Eisenhower had been. Uh, he firmly believed in the central ideology of the Cold War. Uh, he believed that the Soviet Union was an evil menace out to take over the world, that the U.S. was the only nation that could stop them. Uh, he said during the campaign that the enemy is the communist system itself, implacable, insatiable, unceasing in its drive for world domination. He pledged in his inaugural address, uh, as I talked about last time, uh, that the United States was going to do anything it could to assure the survival and success of liberty around the world. Um, and he really modeled himself after FDR's strong leadership. He viewed himself as tough-minded and hard-nosed. Uh, and he surrounded himself with talented and like-minded assistants. Uh, his Secretary of State was a guy named Dean Rusk. His Secretary of Defense was very famous. His name was Robert McNamara. Um, and these were experts in their fields. He, Kennedy, recognized, perhaps more than Eisenhower even did, about the changing nature of the Cold War. He saw the battleground shifting to the emerging nations of the Third World. He said that the great battleground for the defense and expansion of freedom today is Asia, Latin America, Africa, and the Middle East, the lands of the rising peoples. Uh, and so he did, uh, he wanted to strengthen America's ability to meet communist threats in these emerging nations. Um, he gave support to expanding the special forces, the Green Berets. Uh, these were soldiers specifically trained to fight guerrilla conflicts and limited wars. Of course, he campaigned on this idea that there was a missile gap, uh, which turned out to largely to be fictional. Uh, the U.S., if anything, had a vast nuclear superiority to the Soviet Union. Uh, but he feared that the Soviets and communist China would recognize this and put more effort into strengthening their conventional forces. So the U.S. had to do the same. And so the defense budgets increased. Uh, Secretary of Defense McNamara reorganized the whole armed forces. Uh, and he also established a special post in the Defense Department to sell American arms to foreign nations. Uh, so he was very much, you know, sort of a kind of, you know, pro-military strong, you know, guy in terms of expanding the military presence. Uh, he was also very supportive of the idea of promoting peaceful revolution in some of these unaligned countries, uh, while at the same time expanding American influence and promoting stable pro-Western governments around the world. So he favored expanding America's influence both through peaceful and through military means. Uh, to repair our relationship with Latin America, he proposed what he called an Alliance for Progress, which was a series of programs for the peaceful development and stabilization of Latin American nations. Uh, he inaugurated the Agency for International Development to coordinate foreign aid. He established the Peace Corps, which was a program to send young men and women, young men, American men and women, to work in some of these developing nations around the world. Uh, because Kennedy was so keenly interested in expanding America's influence, especially over our traditional sphere of the Western Hemisphere, the fact that Cuba, a nation that was only 90 miles away from the United States, had fallen to communism, was a particular thorn in Kennedy's side. And we're going to see how the Kennedy administration's almost obsession with Cuba leads us into several conflicts during his term as president. So the first of these was something that he actually inherited from the Eisenhower administration. Uh, the CIA under Eisenhower had begun training Cuban exiles in Guatemala in early 1961 
for a future invasion and overthrow of the Cuban leader, Fidel Castro. Uh, and Kennedy inherited these plans, and he decided to go through with them because he was told by all of his advisors that it, the invasion, if it was helped by the U.S., would be successful. And the CIA was very confident in this because they had experience doing this sort of thing. They had gone into Iran and done this. They had gone into Guatemala and done this. Uh, and we would successfully toppled regimes that the U.S. expected of being communist before. So on the morning of April 17th, 1961, a little over 1,500 trained Cuban exiles came ashore at the Bay of Pigs in southwest Cuba. And unfortunately, the airstrikes, which were supposed to have taken out Castro's air forces, never materialized. And Castro knew about the plan beforehand, and he ended up moving the planes that were targets out of harm's way. So the plan was for these ground forces to gain support from the local population and to cross the island and invade this, the capital city of Havana. And the CIA kind of assumed that when this invasion started, all the Cuban people would come along and uprise and, you know, sort of spark a violent uprising against Castro. But by the time the invasion began, Castro already had executed or imprisoned suspected American collaborators. So this invasion quickly faltered, and Kennedy decided not to order any further escalation. He decided not to order more U.S. bombings or invade with U.S. troops. By the time the fighting ended, about three days or so later, 68 of these Cuban exiles were dead. Uh, the rest of them had been captured. It's generally assumed that the Cuban losses were much higher than that. Uh, but this was a severe administration to, uh, or severe embarrassment to the Kennedy administration. The director of the CIA, Alan Dulles, um, and two other high-level subordinates were forced to resign because of the Bay of Pigs. Uh, Castro was now more securely in power, but of course he's also more hesitant and wary of future U.S. intervention in Cuba. Now he knows that the Kennedy administration is kind of out to get him. Um, and what's more important, what's important about the Bay of Pigs is that it really reflects this kind of, you know, obsession with getting rid of Castro, and it contributes to this atmosphere of tension that leads us up to the Cuban Missile Crisis, which happens a year and a half later. Now, in the aftermath of the Bay of Pigs fiasco, Kennedy goes to Vienna in June of 1961 for his very first meeting with the Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev, uh, and the meeting does achieve some results, but the tensions between the U.S. and the Soviets are not lessened in any way. Khrushchev is making veiled threats of war unless the U.S. is stopped supporting the non-communist uh, West Berlin. Uh, and Khrushchev is really facing a number of problems at this point with, when it came to Germany. Uh, there was the growing military power of West Germany. Uh, there were strengthened ties with the West going on. The East German regime was in comparatively a pretty weak position. Um, and then you had West Berlin, this kind of middle of, in the middle of East Germany, communist East Germany, you have West Berlin as this kind of propaganda and espionage center within the communist bloc. And uh, also, you know, sort of it was coming to be quickly realized that uh, the supposed Soviet nuclear weapon superiority was only a myth. Um, and Khrushchev was particularly unhappy excuse me, unhappy about the mass exodus of East Germans to the West through the easily traversed border in West Berlin. Uh, so he's, you know, sort of not very happy about the American presence there. Um, and Kennedy is taking this, you know, sort of very hard line stance. He refuses to negotiate unless Khrushchev lifts the threat of turning over the access routes to East Germany. Uh, and he's, you know, sort of working to kind of beef up U.S. military forces there. So Khrushchev feels like he has to do something. And so on August 13th, 1961, the East German government, uh, which is complying with directives directly from the Soviet Union, uh, starts to build a wall between East and West Berlin. 
And this becomes quickly known as the Berlin Wall. Uh, as you can see, you know, sort of the part of the construction of it here. Uh, and, you know, there was barbed wire all over the top. It was this, you know, sort of very potent physical symbol. And it was also a very dangerous place. Uh, you know, sort of people who continue to try to escape from East to uh, East Berlin to West Berlin would be killed. Uh, a number of them, you know, a number of people died over the years trying to escape, trying to scale the wall or trying to get over the wall or around it somehow. Uh, so so it was a very dangerous, dangerous place. Uh, so this is kind of, you know, increasing Cold War tensions here. And this kind of leads us up to the Cuban Missile Crisis in the fall of 1962. So there are a number of questions we have to ask ourselves uh, when it comes to the Cuban Missile Crisis. The first of these is, well, what causes this crisis, this flashpoint between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, where tensions get heightened to the point that they had almost never, you know, sort of gotten to that point before. Uh, some historians argue that it was really kind of on the, it was really on the Soviets, that it was uh, Soviet efforts to achieve their strategic goals that, you know, kind of led us to this crisis. Uh Khrushchev is trying to achieve nuclear parity with the United States. He's trying to build up as many, you know, sort of we nuclear weapons as the U.S. has. Uh, he's also, you know, concerned with removing uh, power from West Berlin. Uh, and the Soviets, you know, sort of, of course, uh, didn't have, there was no missile gap. Uh, there was, you know, sort of, the Soviets spent a lot of time in the 1950s and early 1960s promoting this idea that there was a missile gap in order to mask the real deficiency. But by the spring of 1962, most Americans knew that, you know, that that was actually a myth. So the Khrushchev is trying to re kind of regain the strategic initiative here. Uh, and so one of the things he does is that he decides he's going to put Soviet missiles and bomber aircraft into Cuba. Uh, and so this is first reported in August. The Soviets begin moving two types of nuclear weapons to Cuba. Uh, and part of this is because he really thought that the U.S. was planning to invade Cuba again. And it's also retaliation for the fact that the U.S. had surrounded the Soviet Union with a ring of military bases and various types of nuclear missiles. So the, essentially the argument was that since we had placed missiles near Russia, Russia had the right to place missiles near us. So the Soviets were the ones to kind of make the first real move here. Uh, they were the ones to put the missiles in Cuba. But I think we also have to consider whether uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis might have been caused, at least in part, because of long-standing tensions between the U.S. and Cuba. Cuba is kind of the third party here. Uh, and, you know, this kind of long-standing conflict in Cuba over American imperialism. Kennedy had initially celebrated the Cuban Revolution as kind of an improvement over what he called an oppressive regime. But as Castro starts to turn a little bit more and more towards communism, as he starts to become more and more radical, Kennedy turns against him. And the Americans are angry that the Cubans have embraced communism. They've, they're angry that they have allied themselves with the Soviet Union. Uh, this is kind of violating that longstanding tradition of the Monroe Doctrine, where the United States should you know, have, be the preeminent power in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, and it's also related to kind of larger issues of mid-century world politics. We have the erosion of imperialism around the world. We have the rise of independent former colonies as nation states. The Cuban Revolution was the U.S.'s most potent example of this. So Cuba, kind of both symbolically and realistically, is challenging U.S. power over Latin America. And this is kind of the reason behind the U.S. government's many efforts, of which the Bay of Pigs was only the most public, to get rid of Fidel Castro, to reassert American dominance over Cuba. Some historians argue that because the U.S. made all of these attempts to try to get rid of Castro, the Cubans had a good reason to fear American invasion, and so they appealed to the Soviets for help. And Khrushchev, partly to help Castro and also partly for his own reasons, puts the missiles in Cuba. So the argument can be made, I think, that if the U.S. had not been so fixated on removing Castro, the Cuban Missile Crisis might never have happened. Uh, so that's kind of, you know, debatable. Um, these are, you know, sort of things that historians continue to debate. But I think it's interesting to think about these issues.
The second big question is, how did the administration handle this crisis? How did Kennedy respond to the news that Soviets had installed nuclear weapons in Cuba? He's facing a lot of political pressure. Uh, there are upcoming midterm elections happening. Uh, and so he calls in a special committee of his most important advisors to try to figure out how to respond to this, try to figure out what to do. Now, some historians have argued that the Kennedy administration's handling of the Cuban Missile Crisis was really their finest hour. Uh, they point out that Kennedy and his advisors had to deal with, you know, kind of a number of more or less imperfect options on how to respond. There was no great option here, and they eventually decided against all-out military action. Now, Kennedy's Joint Chiefs of Staff were arguing, let's go into Cuba with guns blazing and take them out. Uh, and so Kennedy kind of doesn't do that. He, he argues in favor of a blockade that would be less than an act of war. And if you look at the transcripts of their discussions of this, you know, committee, uh, it reveals that Kennedy was very much aware that military action was going to make the U.S. look pretty bad, uh, and it was going to be seen as kind of an overreaction. Kennedy also kept the crisis and the deliberations a secret until a final decision was made. So he did not let the American people know what he was about this whole thing until he knew what he was going to do about it. Uh, and... The blockade announcement also continued, also contained attempts to negotiate with the Soviets. Uh, and some people have argued that it's Kennedy's refusal to really back down that ultimately convinces Khrushchev to give in and negotiate. Uh, and because he was able to kind of resist his, this pressure from his military advisors, because he sticks to diplomacy and he puts this pressure on the Soviets, that this ultimately results in kind of a peaceful resolution to the crisis. That's kind of one view. Other historians argue that Kennedy's handling of the crisis was not so much a case of, you know, kind of uh, very careful management, but more a case of close calls and near misses and guesses that kind of scare both sides into settlement because things are really, really close here to spinning out of control. This was really, really stressful, uh, right? Kennedy and his advisors are up all night for night after night trying to deal with this problem. There's a lot of emotion. Everybody's super anxious. Some people might have even been close to kind of a physical or a mental breakdown. Kennedy himself had these very chronic medical conditions, which were being exacerbated by all of the stress. He was given amphetamines and steroids to keep himself going, and things are starting to spin more and more out of control and eventually Kennedy kind of you know says okay let's get let's pull back let's compromise let's moderate uh and so the stress and the emotion of these things really I think is something to consider when we're thinking about how the administration handled the crisis and whether that might have contributed to the way it came out. The third big question that we want to think about is well how do ordinary Americans deal with the crisis once we know about, you know, the fact that the Soviets have installed nuclear missiles in Cuba and the Kennedy administration is sending a bunch of ships down there to blockade them from installing any further missiles and we're trying to negotiate them to get them out of there. The nation overwhelmingly backs Kennedy. Uh, a Gallup poll registers 84% support for Kennedy's approach. Uh, the picture on the top uh, right there is a bunch of Cuban immigrants who are marching in support of Kennedy's blockade. Americans ended up stocking up their fallout shelters. Civil defense drills were conducted in schools. Uh, supermarkets saw a run on basic supplies. So people are preparing for the worst, preparing for the, you know, eventual possibility of nuclear war. Kennedy spent most of his time during the crisis dealing with the various military and diplomatic solutions. He doesn't give a lot of attention to civil defense. Uh, and this suggests that, you know, maybe he didn't really believe that civil defense would save many Americans if World War III actually did begin. Kennedy had to know that the U.S. was not prepared domestically for the war that was being risked here. Uh, the government was extremely susceptible to devastating losses and chaos in a surprise attack. Millions of people would have zero chance of survival if those missiles were launched. Um, the U.S. government had never given a lot of attention to civil defense, but 
The escalation of the Cold War in the first few years of the Kennedy administration resulted in some higher budgets devoted to it, uh, a lot more interest in the public on civil defense, but still not much had been really done to actually protect the millions of Americans, especially the poor and minorities in inner cities. So U.S. leaders achieved a lot, or, or achieved a little, while pretending to do a lot. So there was this false impression among the public that the you know vast majority of Americans would be safe in the event of a nuclear war, and that was not the case. During the crisis, some Americans actually left their homes. Uh, it's estimated that as many as 10 million Americans in urban areas took vacations in rural areas that were you know, far away from any potential nuclear target. Civil defense offices around the country fielded frantic calls from people. Uh, there was a kind of this explosion of this previously contained public anxiety over you know, the possibility of nuclear war. But... Most Americans, you know, probably continued their daily lives. Uh, they either thought that the crisis would not lead to war or that if, there, if it did, that there was really nothing that could be done. Um, and it was becoming increasingly apparent that the government could not really save them from this, you know, possibility of nuclear war. So how do, the last question is really how do the U.S. and the Soviets ultimately avert all-out war? Kennedy rules out an airstrike. He goes against what his military advisors are telling him, uh, but he orders the U.S. military on full alert. Uh, a lot of troops and equipment are sent into South Florida. Uh, Key West is turned into kind of this impromptu military base. Uh, he doubles the troop strength at Guantanamo Bay. And the level of the defense condition is raised to DEFCON 3. Uh, and he goes on national television on October 22nd to tell the American people and the rest of the world about the missiles that have been installed by the Soviets in Cuba. He demands that they be removed. He announces he's sending a naval blockade to prevent Soviet ships from bringing in uh, effective mess uh, additional missiles. And he calls this move a quarantine because a blockade is considered to be an act of war. But essentially, that's what it was. Now, for three days, the world is holding its breath. Uh, nuclear war is, you know, expected on the horizon. The blockade officially begins on October 24th. Uh, the Strategic Air Command raises the alert status to DEFCON 2, which is one step away from war footing. Then the Soviet ships that are headed for Cuba turned around. But that doesn't mean that the crisis is over. Khrushchev, on October 26, sends this long, rambling letter to the White House. Uh, he says, okay, we'll remove the missiles if you pledge not to invade Cuba. And they get this letter, and the Americans aren't really quite sure how to respond to it. And before they can, a second letter arrives. And this one is a lot more harsh. And it's demanding that the U.S. withdraw American missiles from Turkey, which, of course, is very close to the Soviet Union. On October 27th, uh, a surface-to-air missile shoots down a U-2 spy plane, an American spy plane, over Cuba. Uh, and U.S. officials take no action to avenge this. Uh, so they, you know, sort of don't do anything about this one sort of thing. Uh, the U.S. begins to plan for a military strike and a possible invasion to be initiated the following week. So they have to decide what to do. Which letter are they going to respond to? And the president under the suggestion of his brother, Attorney General Robert Kennedy, and some other officials who actually knew Khrushchev intimately, they say, respond to the first letter. Respond to the nice letter rather than the harsh letter. And so that's what they end up doing. And JFK secretly dispatches Bobby Kennedy to tell the Soviets that, okay, we will we'll pledge not to invade and you take your missiles out of Cuba, we're already planning on taking those missiles out of Turkey. Uh, and so that had already been set in motion. And Khrushchev accepts this. And this immediate crisis is then, you know, averted. Many Americans interpreted Khrushchev's decision to accept the U.S. offer as capitulation in the face of U.S. military force. But the Soviet leader doesn't come away empty-handed here. It gets something out of the deal. He gets a formal agreement that the U.S. is not going to invade Cuba. He gets this secret promise to remove U.S. missiles from Turkey. 
And he later wrote that he was afraid, Khrushchev later wrote that he was afraid that there would be a military coup in the United States uh, and that this contributed to his decision to accept the deal and to remove the missiles. The Soviet Union could have launched a nuclear attack from Cuba only eight hours after deciding to fire the missiles. And there were more than 100 nuclear weapons being stored in Cuba at that time. So we came awfully, awfully close to all-out nuclear war. And this is the closest we've ever really come to that. So now this brings us to kind of looking at the issue of Vietnam. And we've already talked a little bit about Vietnam uh, when I talked about Eisenhower's foreign policy and how he kind of supports the, first supports the French in their fight against uh, the, you know, sort of nationalist Vietnamese forces under Ho Chi Minh. And then we end up kind of, you know, supporting the South Vietnamese regime uh, against the communist North Vietnamese uh, after, after the French uh, surrender and abandon their colony in Vietnam. So this brings us to Vietnam and how does this conflict kind of escalate? And we can't really understand that until we understand this idea of the Cold War ideology and specifically the idea of the domino theory. The domino theory is kind of based on some fundamental assumptions about the way international relations works, the way nations operate in an international arena. And of course, the domino theory is this idea that if one nation falls to communism, all the other nations around it are going to kind of fall like dominoes, uh, you know, and then eventually the whole world will be communist, I guess. Um, so this is the idea that, you know, a lot of U.S. policymakers are working with here. The idea is that, you know, since other nations are attracted to power and credibility, leading countries, leading nations like the United States must regularly and effectively demonstrate their strength if they want to attract as many allies as possible. Any sign of weakness would correlate to defections and alignment with your enemies. So in regions of the world where states remain unaligned, where they haven't, where nations haven't kind of allied themselves with one of the two big powers yet, even one display of weakness by a leading nation can trigger this domino effect in which the unaligned states join the opposing side, one after the other. Likewise, it works the opposite way as well. Even one display of strength can cause those unaligned states to join your coalition. Uh, and so since these ideologically similar states can more easily align with each other, leading nations like the United States have to pay particular attention to unaligned states where you have ideologies that are battling for supremacy. And of course, Vietnam was one of those places. You have, you know, the South Vietnam, which was, you know, ostensibly democratic, and you have North Vietnam, which is controlled by communists. Once a state is united under an ideology, it will politically align with others like it, the, uh, the thinking goes. And if a rival ideology is encroaching, it's imperative that the leading nation not allow that to spread, especially by triggering that domino effect. So this domino theory, you know, if one nation falls to communism, all the others around it are soon going to follow. This is first developed during the Eisenhower administration, and it actually is first referred to by Eisenhower applying to Indochina, to the region where Vietnam is located. Eisenhower is predicting that if this Vietnam domino falls, that all these other groups, local groups, are going to have, you know, encouragement and material support and momentum to take over Burma and Thailand and Malaysia and Indonesia. And this will give the communist geographical and, st and an economic strategic advantage. Now, the roots of this, Eisenhower is just the first to kind of give this theory a name, but the roots of it go back all the way back to the beginning of the Cold War with the Truman administration. It's the same argument that was made when Truman first articulates the Truman Doctrine, his reason for justifying giving aid to Greece and Turkey. If we allow Greece and Turkey to fall, then all the other states around it and eventually maybe all of Europe is going to fall to communism. So we can't let that happen. So Eisenhower begins, he gives military and economic aid to the French, uh, to the South Vietnamese during the 1950s to protect this important domino. Kennedy and then Johnson administrations, they intervene in the, Vietnam in the 1960s to keep the domino from falling. 
And it's this fear that another failure on the part of the United States to gain control and to stop communist expansion is going to fatally damage American credibility with its allies and, you know, their own reputation. So Kennedy, uh, you know, he comes in and he says, you know, he's determined to draw a line in the sand. And he says he's determined to prevent a communist victory in Vietnam. He says, now we have a problem in making our power credible. He says, and Vietnam looks like the place. So the idea is the United States has to project its power around the world. It has to maintain kind of this hypervigilant credibility, uh, you know, among states around the world. And Vietnam is kind of the locus of that. Now, of course, this kind of comes up against the reality of what was actually happening in Vietnam, the reality of the Vietnamese conflict. Uh, and the problem was is that resistance to foreigners, resistance to foreign influence is really an enduring theme in Vietnamese history. If you know anything about the history of Vietnam itself or the history of the region, it had been a colony of France since 1887. Uh, so it had been part of, you know, kind of this colonial, imperialistic, you know, battles around the world from these leading European nations. Uh, and then it had been invaded by the Japanese during World War II, they battled the Japanese, the Vietnamese. Immediately after the war, Ho Chi Minh, who is a you know kind of really strong Vietnamese nationalist, he believes he wants to see an independent country of Vietnam. He writes a Declaration of Independence for the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, and it's modeled after the American Declaration of Independence. Uh, and this is a quote from it here. It says, the entire Vietnamese people are determined to mobilize all their physical and mental strength to sacrifice their lives and property in order to safeguard their independence and liberty. So you can see from this, you know, sort of really how strong the Vietnamese were in their desire to be an independent country. The French, of course, attempt to re-implement colonial rule, and this results in the first Indochina War. The French are finally defeated in 1956. They withdraw. The country is divided between Ho Chi Minh's communists in the north and the U.S.-backed ZM regime in the south. Ho Chi Minh said at one point that nothing is more precious than independence and liberty. And he actually said it was patriotism, not communism, that inspired me. So the basic argument here is that the U.S. was unable to kind of recognize this nationalist nature of the Vietnamese resistance to kind of foreign influence because we were so committed to this Cold War ideology that we ignored the reality of the conflict in Vietnam, which is that it's more of a nationalist uprising than any kind of attempt by some sort of monolithic communism to take over the world. What's going on in Vietnam is essentially a civil war. It's a localized conflict that we entered because we did not understand its nature. We assumed it to be something other than it was. And the Vietnamese were very much prepared to sustain casualties and to fight to the end and committed to total war because what they were fighting for was independence. And Ho Chi Minh was extremely popular with the Vietnamese people because he was calling for their independence. So this is, you know, sort of understanding kind of the reality of the Vietnamese conflict. So how do we get into involved and how do we actually get into the war? So as I mentioned, the Kennedy administration is committing American power in South Vietnam to help prop up the regime there, the regime uh, by ZM. Uh, and ZM is growing increasingly unpopular. Uh, in 1960, Ho Chi Minh's government in the North establishes a group called the National Liberation Front, uh, also known as the Viet Cong. These were guerrilla forces in the South who were loyal to North Vietnam. Uh, and they start to grow. Uh, the Viet Cong guerrillas are growing to around 10,000 strength in about in 1961, and they're getting support from the local population. They're also getting support from communist China as well. So we have this civil war going on in Vietnam between the North, uh, which is you know the Viet Cong and Ho Chi Minh's forces, and the South. Uh, and Kennedy, 
uh, is, you know, sort of forcing to deal with this. So he his advisors recommend increasing the American military presence in Vietnam uh, and also pledging their support, the complete support to ZM's regime. Kennedy agrees to this. He agrees to expand the American troop commitment in Vietnam from 500 to 10,000 men. Now, these were supposed to be only advisors, uh, they, but they were allowed to actually engage in combat. Uh, he orders Air Force units to bomb Viet Minh targets in South Vietnam. Uh, he promises his full support to the ZM regime. Vietnam is considered to be vital to America's interests because it, it said, they said it represents the cornerstone of the free world in Southeast Asia. And so the Kennedy administration very much buys into the domino theory. They wanted to contain communism. They wanted to isolate the Chinese in particular are, you know, a big factor here. And after the Cuban Missile Crisis has been resolved successfully, the administration is very confident about their ability to escalate military power and yet keep things under control. By 1962, you've got about 12,000 American military personnel in Vietnam who are involved in this conflict. But the Viet Cong, these guerrilla forces in South Vietnam, are continuing to gain ground. The Viet Cong are attacking these villages in South Vietnam, and they are not seen as invaders. They're seen as benefactors. Even though they're attacking these villages, they're you know, pretty popular among the people. Kennedy kind of pins all of the hopes on the government of South Vietnam, ZM's government, waging a successful military campaign and kind of stabilizing some of the political problems that they were dealing with. But the South Vietnamese military is not really seeming very ready or willing to fight. But whatever's really going on in Vietnam is not reaching the American people or Congress. So there's this growing gap between what's actually happening in Vietnam and the Kennedy administration's confidence that they can handle this situation. One of the ways that they attempted to handle this situation was through a little-known program called the Strategic Hamlet Program. And this is kind of a really interesting thing. So what happens is, is that in the Viet Cong have been, you know, beginning this campaign of guerrilla warfare against the South Vietnamese. Uh, and they are attempting to gain support of the rural population. They're attempting to gain recruits, uh, shelter, supplies, information. So in 1961, the South Vietnamese and the Americans develop what they call the Strategic Hamlet Program in order to counter this effort by the Viet Cong. Uh, the ZM government is trying to create a new infrastructure for the country, uh, and they're also trying to increase the support for their regime. Uh, so essentially what, they, what, what this was was an attempt to isolate the rural peasant population from any kind of communist insurgents who might be trying to kind of you know, recruit them or use them for support. So the idea is to create support for the ZM regime by providing supply, by setting up these little villages for the local people of rural Vietnam. And they're, you know, going to provide supplies for them. They're going to provide, you know, going to build these little villages, reform, you know, reform programs for these villages. Theoretically, these hamlets are supposed to be heavily guarded uh, by both residents and national troops. And you can see that here with, you know, sort of this picture of what, you know, a generalized strategic hamlet was supposed to look like. You can see it was supposed to be basically this little village, which is, you know, surrounded by you know, essentially a little fortified village here. Uh, it's got, you know, a watchtower. There's, you know, a barbed wire fence. There's a moat. There is a bamboo barrier. And then inside was, you know, all these things like a school and a market and a radio station. And, you know, of course, a place to store your arms, all kinds of things, you know, houses for the people. So theoretically, they're supposed to be guarded by, you know, sort of both the residents of these villages and by national troops. And they're supposed to be connected by radio to the government in Saigon. They're given supplies, they're given medical and educational programs. Most of these hamlets never ended up getting these programs, however. So by July of 1963, over eight and a half million people had been resettled in these hamlets. There were about a little over 7,200 hamlets built uh, in South Vietnam. And they were constructed very rapidly. 
Uh, and so this, because of this, it, you know, sort of really ends up backfiring. Um, and it ends up, you know, sort of backfiring drastically, and it leads to increased sympathy for the communist forces. There's widespread opposition to this program. Uh, and part of this is because, you know, the peace, the people of South Vietnam were not terribly happy about being forced by their government to move to, you know, sort of this strategic hamlet. They didn't want to have to, you know, walk farther to get to work. Uh, they didn't want to have to leave their, you know, ancestral burial grounds, uh, you know, for religious reasons. Uh, they resented having to work for the government, essentially, for no pay. So this was, you know, sort of a really, you know, problematic program that ends up, you know, only increasing the sympathy for the communists in South Vietnam. And this is what, one of the things that leads directly to the fall of the ZM regime. So the ZM regime is increasingly corrupt. It's ruthlessly suppressing any kind of domestic opposition. Um, part of this is religious conflict. Uh, there was, the ZM regime was, a, was uh, dominated by Roman Catholics, um, but the majority of the v country was Buddhist. Uh, and Buddhist nationalists... Uh, are protesting the ZM regime in the spring and summer of 1963. Uh, ZM's troops end up shooting into a crowd of Buddhists who are celebrating the birth of Buddha it, by waving flags. And there was a, you know, a rule by the government that no flags other than the government's were supposed to be allowed. Um, and this is kind of, you know, just tensions between over religion, over, you know, politics uh, there are anti-government riots in Saigon. Uh, in retaliation for this, ZM raids a bunch of Buddhist pagodas. Uh, and in protest of that, several Buddhist priests end up burning themselves in public, which you can see here. This is a very famous photo of one of those priests, um, you know, kind of in protest of these, of these policies by ZM, uh, you know, kind of burning himself. Uh, the Buddhists are joined by students. Uh, and essentially, you've got full-scale rebellion on their hands. Uh, by August, ZM has declared martial law. The Kennedy administration doesn't quite know how to handle this. Uh, they try to pressure ZM into making reforms by cutting off aid to him, but it doesn't go far enough. Uh, and by August, the administration is secretly beginning to consider supporting getting rid of ZM, a coup against ZM. Uh, and finally, uh, preparations for this coup are made in October. And evidence suggests that Kennedy and his advisors uh, had considerable role in orchestrating this coup. They gave support to the, you know, Saigon military officers who were going to execute this, this takeover. Um, they withdraw aid from ZM himself. Um, and they really make it clear to the South Vietnamese that ZM has, you know, lost its American ally. But they didn't really believe that ZM would actually be killed. But that is, in fact, what happened. On November 1st, 1963, ZM is captured in a military coup that had been supported by the United States, and he's subsequently executed. Uh, now, having a hand in this coup, now that we've gotten rid of ZM, America has, you know, sort of has to support the South Vietnamese government that follows him. And so we end up, you know, kind of just tying ourselves more and more closely to the government of South Vietnam. Now this, of course, Kennedy is assassinated just a few weeks la after this, and Johnson takes over. And this kind of, the next sort of major incident comes in the summer of 1964, uh, and this is, of course, the Gulf of Tonkin incident. This occurs less than a year after Johnson takes office. Uh, and what happened was that U.S. warships are in the Gulf of Tonkin off the coast of Vietnam. Uh, they had been cooperating with the South Vietnamese in attacks against the North Vietnamese. Uh, and the CIA had begun a very highly classified program of covert attacks on North Vietnam. So this American destroyer, the Maddox, is in the Gulf of Tonkin conducting a reconnaissance mission. Uh, and it was ostensibly attacked uh, in international waters on August 2nd, 1964, by a group of North Vietnamese patrol boats. The Maddox is able to evade this attack. Uh, they chase the patrol boats away. They aren't, you know, damaged or anything like that. A couple of days later, another attack is reported. Uh, and it's, you know, sort of not clear whether this second attack ever actually occurred. Uh, you know, sort of the 
ship's sonar, you know, people were on high alert. They were kind of looking out for anything and they, you know, might might or might not have actually been attacked. Uh, but U.S. authorities and the crew were convinced that the attack had taken place. Uh, and in December of 2005, the NSA actually finally declassified secret documents that showed no attack had actually occurred. Johnson, of course, uses this as a pretext to call for escalating the conflict in Vietnam. He says that these attacks are open aggression on the high seas, that these attacks are unprovoked, uh, and he orders the first American air attacks on North Vietnamese ports in retaliation. And so he goes to Congress and he requests a resolution from Congress authorizing him to take, quote, all necessary measures to defend, uh, to repel any attack against American forces. So he is, you know, sort of basically saying, give me an authorization to do anything I need to, to, you know, defend America's interests here. And this resolution ends up passing unanimously in the House, and there are only two votes against it in the Senate. So this essentially allows Johnson to wage war without a formal declaration from Congress. And this results in a huge increase in presidential power. Congress has essentially abdicated its authority to declare war here. So now this is kind of the moment of decision, right? This is the moment where we have to decide how are we going to, are we going to escalate this war? American prestige and our reputation and our credibility are on the line in Vietnam. Remember, according to the domino theory, signs of national power and weakness are really crucial components to this theory here. Uh, and American officials are really feeling that unless the United States remains committed to these efforts in Vietnam, we are going to be seen by others as weak. We're going to be seen as unable to fulfill our promises. And it's going to cause unaligned states to move over into that Soviet camp. Now, it's not merely that the U.S. has a stake in Vietnam. It's also a kind of a personal conflict. It's personal for Johnson and his advisors. His officials, like McNamara and McGeorge Bundy, uh, they had been counseling the U.S. to remain firm for years. And to go against that now would mean that they would have to admit that they had made a mistake. They would have to, th it would threaten their careers. And Johnson himself felt there was a lot personally at stake in Vietnam. His domestic political objectives, he had all these ambitions with the Great Society. His historical reputation becomes tied up in Vietnam. He vows he's not going to be the first American president to lose a war. He views attacks on the Vietnam policy as attacks on himself. Uh, and this is kind of essentially equating America's credibility with his own credibility. Um, he fears that, you know, sort of he is going to be personally humiliated uh, if we fail in Vietnam. He sees the war as kind of a test of manliness. Uh, and this is kind of, you know, coloring his whole worldview. And it makes any kind of retreat, any kind of backtrack, backtracking in Vietnam impossible. And he demands consensus and loyalty from his advisors. And combined with his very powerful personality, this results in a climate in the Johnson administration that really discourages anyone from offering alternative policies or alternative views. So they really have to kind of think about what are their options here. Uh, and eventually they decide we're going to, you know, sort of continue to keep escalating the war. Uh, and they, policymakers are very much aware that victory, the key to victory, lay in South Vietnam. We had to, quote unquote, win the hearts and minds of the Vietnamese people. But the way we end up sort of trying to do that is by striking at North Vietnam. We need this a stable, effective government in South Vietnam, but we ought to try to bring about that stability by bombing the North. Um, and so that's kind of how we start to escalate things. And this is when we start to see the escalation of troops. So in March of, of, 19, in March of 1965, we have the first official combat troops entering Vietnam. About 3,500 Marines arrive in Vietnam. They are joining about 25,000 so-called military advisors who were already there. But these are the first official combat troops. Uh, in 
1965, Johnson orders an increase of troops from 75,000 to 125,000. Uh, in December of 1965, uh, there are, you know, sort of the troops are gradually escalating. Um, in April of 1966, more Americans are being killed now than South Vietnamese for the very first time. Uh, and so by December of 1965, there are 184,000 U.S. troops in Vietnam. Uh, by February of 1966, Johnson orders the increase of troops to 429,000 by August. Uh, and essentially, the U.S. strategy here is a war of attrition. Uh, and basically, we're trying to kind of, you know, grind down this opposition in the South. We're trying to get rid of any kind of opposition in the South uh, and, you know, basically push back any kind of communist incursion. And according to sort of the military, the key to this was high body counts. We had to kill as many of the enemy as possible in order to kind of demoralize and defeat the enemy. By early 1968, which is really seen as kind of the turning point in the war, there are more than 500,000 American troops fighting in Vietnam. And Johnson and his military advisors are saying all along to the American people, we're making progress and, you know, sort of today the enemy is losing, we're, we're you know, gaining ground. These are mostly platitudes designed to quiet an increasingly skeptical and critical American public. Now, at the beginning of the escalation in Vietnam, 82% of the American public felt that U.S. forces should stay in Vietnam until the communists withdrew. And it's really students, it's really young people who start to question the basic Cold War assumptions about the need to battle communism worldwide that are kind of behind the American involvement in Vietnam. The first anti-war teach-in happens in March of 1965 at the University of Michigan. And we start to see these sort of teach-ins uh, start following all across the country. Initially, these kind of meetings are supposed to be kind of places where supporters and opponents of the war can, you know, kind of come and they can speak and can give their opinions. But pretty soon it becomes, they really become more like anti-war rallies. Uh, and organizations like Students for a Democratic Society get involved uh, and activists start campaigning against the draft. Uh, they attack ROTC units on campus. Uh, they seek to discredit businesses that are part of the so-called war machine. They also protest their own university's collaboration with the federal government and industry and research. Protesters start marching outside the White House, uh, chanting slogans like, Hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? Uh, in 1967, 300,000 people march in New York City in and in Washington, 100,000 people go and they try to attempt to close down the Pentagon. A lot of this opposition to the war involved the draft, which many people saw was very unfair. And it was. It really heavily targeted uh, people who were poor, uh, people who didn't have other ways of, you know, sort of getting out of the war. Uh, protesters burned their draft cards. They returned them to the Pentagon in acts of civil disobedience. Many people, uh, thousands, went to Canada uh, to escape being called up. Even after the government institutes a lottery system, the draft is still seen as very much unfair because it's often the poor, as I've said, or those without connections who are the ones who get called up and who can't avoid having to you know, be drafted. And there's increasing opposition to the war among veterans as well, uh, people who, you know, had gone over and fought in Vietnam. Uh, there's opposition while they're there. This results in uh, widespread drug use among the troops. Uh, there's a practice that was known as fragging, which was killing your superior officer uh, that happens a few times. Uh, after returning home, a lot of veterans organize themselves into anti-war groups, uh, and they conduct informal investigations into atrocities that have been committed in Vietnam. And a lot of the public demonstrations against an opposition to the war was at least in part because of how the war was being presented on television. Vietnam has been called the first televised war, the first living room war. 
And journalists were bringing kind of the horrors of the war nightly into America's living rooms. And so this eventually inspires a lot of revulsion and exhaustion. Working and middle class Americans begin to get tired. They begin to, you know, sort of start viewing the war as this really negative thing as they see these grim news reports. They see these graphic pictures. And so people begin to wonder, well, why are we really there? Why are we fighting? Now, there are a few high-profile instances of graphic depictions of violence and destruction that aired on television. Uh, and, you know, so these incidents were dramatic, but they weren't necessarily typical of, t of Vietnam TV coverage. Uh, there wasn't really a lot of blood and gore that was, you know, sort of shown a lot on TV. Um, maybe about a quarter of the film reports from Vietnam showed images of dead or wounded soldiers. Uh, most of these were fleeting. They weren't necessarily particularly graphic. Uh, but it was very different from what Americans had seen before uh, in terms of how the war was being shown. Uh, because in, you know, sort of World War II, images like this were almost never shown. Uh, and, you know, it was really all about, you know, sort of... Uh, you know, kind of depicting the war in the most sanitized way possible. Uh, but in world in Vietnam, you start to see a change. Um, and particularly later on in the war, after the Tet Offensive, after, you know, sort of uh, television coverage begins to change, journalists start to grow skeptical of the government's claims that we're making progress in Vietnam. And the course of the war is presented, you know, more as a string of recurring battles rather than any kind of decisive victories. There's more emphasis on the human costs of the war. Um, and we start to see kind of the divisions and the anti-war movement, um, which in early in the war had been kind of vilified as being inspired by communists. Later in the war, it's all, it's you know really depic depicted as kind of a legitimate political movement by the media. So by the fall of 1967, uh, polls are already showing that a majority of Americans believed it had been a mistake to get involved in Vietnam, uh, and by early 1968. Two successive secretaries of defense concluded that the war could not be won at a reasonable cost. Now, of course, this information was not being shared with the public, at least not at this point. The turning point of the war, the Tet Offensive, and how it was covered by the American media really brings home to the public the futility of the war. So this brings us to kind of that turning point, the Tet Offensive. So all throughout 1965, 1966, 1967, the U.S. military and the Defense Department is telling the public that the war is a matter of destroying this insurgency in the countryside, that we are trying to get these high body counts, and this is the metric for progress. Uh, and the U.S. strategy for dealing with North Vietnam is to use bombing to pressure them to get out of the conflict, to draw, you know, sort of the North Vietnamese out of it. And American commanders are convinced that this is going to work, that this is going to have success. And so in late 1967, the leading American general, General William Westmoreland, he says that he believes it's possible for U.S. troops to begin pulling out of Vietnam in two years or less. So this is in late 1967. So it's very shocking to the American public to hear that on January 30th, 1968, the North Vietnamese launch a major offensive against South Vietnamese cities. Uh, and this is timed to, the, this op, these operations are called the Tet Offensive because it's timed to coincide with Tet, which is the Vietnamese Lunar New Year. The South Vietnamese and the American forces are kind of on a relaxed footing at this point because there's this annual truce that's supposed to happen during the Lunar New Year holiday. Now, Westmoreland was aware that the North Vietnamese were building up their military, preceding these attacks, but he thought it was going to be directed against one local area where the U.S. had been battling the North Vietnamese for a few weeks. Instead, the attack comes, it's much more broader than that. It come, They attack over 60 major South Vietnamese cities. And the attacks are everywhere pretty quickly repulsed, except for in Saigon, where the fighting lasted for three days, and in the city of Hue, where the fighting lasted for a month. During the communist occupation of Hue, the Viet Cong massacred nearly 3,000 South Vietnamese. 
but casualties during the Tet Offensive were considerably higher for the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong forces. Uh, and this was partly because the Viet Cong forces, they were, of course, the guerrilla forces in the South. They had previously operated covertly, and now they were being exposed. And so they were very vulnerable to, you know, exposure and, uh, you know, sort of being killed. And so this is a very famous photograph here on the, on the bottom left uh, of a... Uh, South Vietnamese general who is executing a Viet Cong prisoner. This shooting was captured by a, an American photographer and an ABC News crew, and this footage of this execution plays all over the American news programs. Um, and within a month, Westmoreland says, well, this offensive had really been a disaster for the Viet Cong. Uh, and so it really kind of, you know, ends up, ends up destroying the Viet Cong. Any subsequent fighting was almost done exclusively by North Vietnamese forces. Uh, but this means that the U.S. can no longer engage the enemy without mounting a major invasion. We cannot, we have to escalate the war. We have to risk drawing the Chinese into the conflict. And so it becomes increasingly clear that the U.S. doesn't have a strategy for victory here. It only has a, the only thing we can do is just keep escalating this war. Even though we, the offensive was a military disaster for the North Vietnamese, it was really seen in the U.S. as a defeat. And this is largely because of the media coverage. Uh, and it, partly because the U.S. Embassy in Saigon was attacked. Uh, most of the American media characterized the Tet Offensive as a defeat for the United States. And part of the reason for this perception is that this part of South Vietnam that television viewers had naturally assu assumed would be the most secure place, the United States Embassy in Saigon had come under attack, and that attack had been televised in living rooms across America. People just did not understand why this attack was even possible. If we were winning in Vietnam, how could they mount such a, you know, sort of massive attack on us. And the embassy building was badly damaged, but after the after the battle General Westmoreland, he stands in the rubble and he declares that it's a victory because the embassy had the, the enemy had never actually entered the embassy itself. And reporters recalled being very shocked that Westmoreland is standing in the ruins of this US embassy and he's saying, "Oh no, everything's great." There was a special broadcast by Walter Cronkite, who was the nation's leading news figure at the time. He went to Vietnam. He was, you know, reporting directly from there. And he uh, reports, he closes his report from Vietnam by expressing the view that the war is unwinnable um, and that the U.S. was going to have to try to find a way out of it. Uh, and President Johnson is watching this broadcast and he says, if I've lost Cronkite, I've lost the war. So he knows that this is going to be a major, you know, sort of influence on the American public's opinion. The fact that the communists were able to mount this major countrywide assault was a real blow to the U.S. hopes of getting out of Vietnam, winning the war rapidly. It calls into question everything that the American public had been told about how we are making progress in the war. And in the wake of the, in the aftermath, uh, it becomes clear the U.S. has no strategy for victory. Westmoreland actually goes to Johnson and he says, no, I need more troops. I need 200,000 more troops. And Johnson turns down his request, but he secretly allows the troop level in Vietnam to rise to about 549,000. Just a few days after Westmoreland's request becomes public, Johnson, who is the sitting president, he almost is nearly defeated in the New Hampshire primary. He just barely wins against the anti-war candidate Eugene McCarthy. And pretty soon after that, Robert Kennedy announces he is getting into the presidential race against Johnson. So on March 31st, 1968, Johnson goes on American television and he announces he is not going to seek re-election to the presidency. Westmoreland is soon replaced as the head army commander in Vietnam. Um, and he, as he's being, you know, fired, basically, he's very angry. He declares that, you know, he was on the verge of winning the war. And if he'd only allowed him to stay in there, he would have won. Uh, and this kind of, you know, shows you the mindset. So by the spring of 1968, it is clear that the U.S. strategy in Vietnam is not working, despite this ostensible victory in the Tet Offensive. So what do we do now? 
Some in the army were arguing, well, you know, maybe we should invade North Vietnam. But the defense secretary, Robert McNamara, he believed that this would risk bringing the Chinese into the war. And we now know from documentary evidence that this was probably right. The North Vietnamese have been getting assistance from the Chinese all along. Uh, they also had security commitments with the Chinese as early as 1960. In 1962, Ho Chi Minh went to China. He requested aid. Uh, and the Chinese were basically, you know, sort of pledging to come to North Vietnam's defense. The war was really though also about, really always about the political future of South Vietnam, and a direct attack against North Vietnam would not have helped to stabilize the South. The insurgency in the South was primarily indigenous. Uh, it was this kind of localized conflict. Uh, and the Southerners were willing to go on the defense, were more willing to go on the offensive than Nor the North Vietnamese. They were prepared to carry on this struggle against the United States, whom they saw as kind of, you know, the invaders, no matter what the North Vietnamese did. Now, the probable casualties of a North Vietnamese invasion would have been massive, um, and it would have led to more do uh, opposition domestically. So we can't invade North Vietnam. That's, you know, sort of one option is out. Others argued that the U.S. should invade other Southeast Asian countries, Laos, Cambodia possibly, uh, try to block the flow of men and supplies into the South. Uh, and this proposal was explored, but it was ultimately deemed unacceptable uh, because it was really beyond U.S. capabilities at this point. But again, the majority of communist forces in the South were actually Southerners. They were not coming in through other countries. So it was this localized, in, you know, in-country insurgency. And again, casualties would have been extremely high. The third idea was, well, maybe we can kind of, you know, gather U.S. forces into some strategic enclaves. Uh, and, you know, sort of we're fighting this fundamentally indigenous insurgency. Um, we can only, you know, sort of fight that through counterinsurgency techniques. But... This didn't seem like it was, you know, sort of really a good option either for a lot of people. Um, and, you know, this had been tried before by the French and it had failed. Uh, so what ends up happening is that the war, you know, sort of really is kind of any strategy is going to require having a viable South Vietnamese government that had credibility in the eyes of its people. And this simply did not exist. The North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong, they were committed to total war. They were prepared to sustain casualties beyond what Americans were willing to accept. So that kind of leads me, at least, to conclude that the American involvement in Vietnam was really kind of doomed from the start. And it was not only doomed from the start, but it completely destroyed Johnson's presidency. And this picture kind of really says it all. This is a picture of Johnson listening to a taped report from a field commander in Vietnam. And it kind of gives you a sense of, you know, sort of the futility of the whole conflict. Uh, and we're going to continue to talk about Vietnam next week when we get into talking about uh, the 1970s and the Nixon administration and how the Vietnam War, you know, comes to a conclusion. Uh, but for now, uh, let's leave it there and we'll talk about Vietnam a little bit more next week.